This episode is sponsored by Great Dane Trailers. From Transport Topics in Washington, D.C., this is Road Signs. Here is your host, Seth Clevenger. Thank you for listening to Road Signs, the podcast series from Transport Topics that examines the trends and technologies that are shaping the future of trucking. In this episode, we're going to take a close look at the growth of active safety technology for commercial trucks. Collision mitigation systems and lane departure warnings can prevent crashes by automatically applying the brakes or alerting the driver when a vehicle is straying out of its lane. But even though these technologies have been available for many years now, the trucking industry is still split between fleets that are equipping their trucks with these safety systems and those that still aren't willing to pay the additional cost. So what will it take to spur broader adoption of active safety technology? Will these systems eventually become an industry standard? And how will they improve in the years ahead? We'll set out to answer those questions in this episode. To learn more, I recently sat down with executives at two major suppliers of truck safety technology during the 2019 North American Commercial Vehicle Show in Atlanta. I spoke with Mike Hawthorne, CEO at Bendix Commercial Vehicle Systems, as well as Richard Beyer, the company's Vice President of Engineering and R&D. I also discussed active safety technology with John Morrison, President of Wabco Americas. Let's go ahead and play those interviews. We're here in Atlanta at the 2019 North American Commercial Vehicle Show, and we're very excited to welcome Mike Hawthorne, who's the CEO of Bendix Commercial Vehicle Systems, as well as Richard Beyer, Vice President of Engineering and R&D at Bendix. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks Thank for you for having us. So active safety technologies such as forward collision mitigation and uh, lane departure warnings have been on the market for years now, and a growing number of fleets are purchasing them as they order new vehicles. Uh, but overall, industry adoption remains uh, still somewhat limited. Uh, so I want to get your take on what are the actual numbers right now? What are the adoption rates, the take rates for active safety systems on the market today in new, new Class A trucks? North of 45% Is that take about where rates, we're at? yeah. And, you know, when you look at the uh, scope of, of trucking companies out there, of course, many of the large fleets are using active safety systems and have been uh, using this technology for many years now. Uh, but adoption rates are lower for medium-sized and, and smaller carriers. Uh, could you guys talk about the factors that you believe matter most for that segment of the market and uh, what it'll take to, to see more adoption uh, on, that, on that part of the industry? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things, but when you look at the larger fleets, they know their costs to the tenth of a penny on everything from fuel, tire, to brake maintenance. They see a direct payback on being self and one being self-insured, and they see the immediate payback for elimination of rear-end collisions and things like rollovers. So those really have a big impact for their bottom line. The smaller fleets may not have the capability to have that level of data and to prove to themselves that hey this really does have a payback and the fact that typically they're not self-insured they're using the commercial insurance industry where some of those savings take a little longer to trickle down sure and uh, mike i'll ask you to provide a maybe an overview of uh, how the industry has changed i guess adoption rates over time do you feel like we're nearing a, a turning point or maybe the uh, the point at which we'll see you know true mass adoption i think at the moment you're starting to find that the industry accepts collision mitigation is a necessary part of how you operate in the environment and as people have become more accustomed and believe that the systems are working properly it's become almost an expected type of function on the truck i think as richard was saying the the big fleets have adopted it so we have a lot of data now that shows the benefit that exists with that type of technology and now it's a matter of trying to be sure that that same type of data is available so the smaller fleets can see it and i think they'll adopt it as well i don't think we're that far away from this just being a standard feature on most trucks okay and of course, any successful rollout of active safety technology, whether it's collision mitigation or lane departure warnings, uh, this requires buy-in from the drivers to have a good uh, deployment. And uh, of course, we've all heard stories of drivers who are maybe at first uh, resistant to new technology in the cab, and uh, they, they have to be, uh, you know, maybe have to experience it before they really understand it and, and come to accept it. Uh, what do you find is, is really key to, to gaining driver acceptance of technology that ultimately does help them improve uh, safety? Well, I've seen a couple of things in my career that, that speak to how human beings just accept change. You know, so anything that's different eventually becomes somewhat rejected because it is new. 
and then you have to show that it actually produces the, the outcome that you want, and then people become comfortable with it. Uh, one of the areas that needs, uh, has needed and needs probably even further information is when we have false positives. So the system is designed to actually create a safer environment, and sometimes it may detect a hazard that doesn't exist. Now that creates a different type of experience for the driver. So you have to both reject the false positives, and you have to continue to show the improvement and how it, it brings a safer working environment to the operator. And how much uh, how improvement have you seen on that, the false positives? I mean, how much has that declined uh, as the systems have been uh, refined over the years? When you look at our latest systems that are called Fusion, where you're using camera and radar together, um, the false positives for actual intervention are really close to zero. It's like right. .001. And that's a big deal because, as Mike mentioned, these safety systems, you uh, ne need to um, make sure that they're doing the intervention when you need them, and then when you're not supposed to intervene, you don't want it because you can lose the trust of a driver extremely quickly. Sure. I think it's important to point out too that you know as we look at our driver assistance systems, they are designed around having the driver have a more uh, safe operating environment. So we're not looking at replacing the driver; we're really looking at augmenting the environment in which they operate. And I think for them, it's going to be important because as they want to rely on technology to do a better job, we have the technologies that can help. Absolutely, and uh, you know along these uh, uh, the same topic, you know FMCSA recently announced a project aimed at promoting the adoption of, of ADAS uh, Advanced Driver Assist Systems as a way to improve highway safety. And you know the agency will be partnering with industry groups like uh, American Trucking Associations and, and TMC as part of that effort. Uh, but I want to ask you, uh, in the supplier side of the industry, what will it take for a, a project like that? You know, using uh, uh, education and, and promotion to, to really achieve his goals and move the needle on uh, the use of this, this technology in this industry. I think there's probably a, a strong commercial element that says once you can provide the data and show the business case stands that you can actually reduce the operating costs for that particular truck, um, now you've got a reason to get engaged because the, the money's there, to be very right. clear. Um, I think as you come further into the, the decision on, on how you want to adopt it, it's going to be doing the qualified stories to say, in an instance, this particular situation was presented to the driver and the system helped avoid an accident, you know, up to and including something that could have been very, very difficult. Right. So that uh, has a qualified effect when you talk about the commercial aspects and a qualified effect when you just talk about the safety interventions. Sure. You know, it, it appears that, you know, unlikely, at least in the near term, that Active safety, whether it's uh, automatic emergency braking, um, will be uh, mandated by the government. You know, of course, we've seen electronic stability control, but uh, the, the latest and greatest technology, it looks like it's uh, going to be uh, based on the business case. You know, the business case will have to stand, and, and fleets will, will adopt it uh, based on return on investment. Uh, so I want to get your thoughts on uh, what you, how you view the, the business case and the return on investment for collision mitigation. I mean, obviously, uh, you don't know uh, how many accidents necessarily you might have prevented, but you can, you can start to look at that. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on the ROI for uh, this type of technology? Well, I think we can actually go a little step further because we have a system called Safety Direct that sits behind our fusion system. So when you have close calls, you're actually sending one information to the back office telling the safety managers you've had a close call, but then also you're taking video 10 seconds before and after the event. So you can see if you had a close call with a vehicle and there was a CMS intervention or AEB intervention, you see that that would have been a collision. So you actually are seeing when you have these systems and then Safety Direct processor comes with the fusion systems, you have that data available. Right. So you can see it. And one point I just wanted to add to where you're talking about the take rates. When you look at the, the business case, it's the total, the life cycle of the product. Just like with disc brakes and some of the other safety technologies, as they become more accepted in the marketplace, they're also going to be sought after on used vehicles. And then the residual value of those vehicles is going to increase where it's not seen as a hindrance, right? And when those the used truck buyers start asking for those types of systems, right. it's going to also drive the take rates when you for look sure. at the new vehicles. And too, if you, in, in this concept of um, how, say, your insurance rates are set, the experience that any company or an individual has really reflects what the risk is associated with operating that vehicle in this case. 
a better experience with collision mitigation systems is going to provide a, a better uh, insurance rate. So at some point, the collective data is going to provide a statistical view. Right. So before and after, you're going to statistically be less likely to have an accident or an incident, yes. and that's going to make the, the business case work. Great isn't just in our name, it's in our DNA. Great is our foundation, our promise, it's our call to action. Great is our outstanding commitment to our customers and our customers' customers, whose hard work drives us, inspires us. Great demands more, goes further, it leads the way, answers the call. From the first mile to the last, for the road ahead, for over a century, We've worked tirelessly to live up to our name, and we'll keep working because great doesn't stop. Great Dane Trailers. I also want to ask you guys about fleets that haven't specced safety systems in the past. You know, maybe these are smaller fleets that are operating on, on pretty thin margins, and maybe they just don't think that they can afford to invest up front in a, in a full collision mitigation system. Uh, where would be a good place for them to start? You know, would it start with you know air disc brakes or uh, maybe uh, automatic tire inflation? Uh, what would be a good first you know way to kind of dip your toes into uh, safety technology if you're brand new to it and maybe don't have a lot of capital? Well, I mean, if you look at even today, like disc brakes is definitely a good place to start. But a vast majority of the on-highway tractors today at least have disc brakes as standard on the steer axle. Mm. And then you have the option to go all the way around the truck. And that is a foundation, whether you, what collision mitigation or other system you put on it after, because now you're doing active braking. You now have a superior brake that's going to slow the vehicle down more and faster than, a, say, a, a drum brake solution. So that adds to that benefit. And then it looks, it also has to look at a fleet, look at their CSA scores. Are they a very safe fleet? Do they have very good training programs? Now you can supplement it with that safety direct system that I was mentioning. That can now be used to help train the right. drivers to operate safely. Because in the, in the all end of this, you still cannot replace a good, safe, operating commercial vehicle driver. These are supplemental systems to help right. when you're not in, you know, not being attentive to make sure that you stay in a safe place. Yep. And I do want to go a little bit further with air disc brakes. Just how important are disc brakes for the future growth of active safety technology? You know, this is often, you know, they're often viewed as a sort of the building block for more advanced systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so how important is it for the industry at large to go further with uh, closer to full adoption of, of air disc brakes uh, compared with, uh, and where are we now uh, in terms of adoption today compared with uh, drum, drum brakes? Yeah, there, you, there are, uh, there are two, two things that I think you want to look at um, when you're trying to move towards an automated system. The actuators in this case with the, the disc brakes need to be predictable and air disc brakes are infinitely more predictable than drum brakes. So when you ask for the brake, you get it and you know it's going to be performing at the same level every time. Um, the other is uh, status. You need to be able to know that the maintenance state of that brake is adequate for the task. And as you move towards more machine automation, you have to know for sure that all of the elements required for the truck to move safely are going to be available. So air disc brakes are predictable and the technologies that are coming now to ensure that you have a, st a good state, a health state of that, that particular actuator are also coming online. Okay. One of the uh, newest developments in onboard uh, safety technology is the, the very beginnings of active steering starting to make its way into the industry. Uh, you know, one of the first examples of that will be lane keeping assistance, uh, similar to what we've seen for a few years now in, in the passenger car market. Uh, but what are your thoughts on you know, how soon this might become widely available in commercial vehicles? And uh, what do you expect from uptake there? Do you, do you think that fleets will see the value in automating steering and having some steering assist? I mean, when you look at a Class 8 vehicle, it's a little different than in a pass car. It's a little bit of a toy, fun to play with. I like to play with mine, but the systems that are in pass car are nowhere near the level that they would need to be in commercial vehicle. However, when you look at the options, I mean, there's things like crosswind compensation or road crown compensation that have nothing to do with lane keeping, right? right. But are very much take a stress off the driver if you have a very strong crosswind, which can cause the driver to have to fight the steering all the time. So functions like that can be very beneficial. But in our opinion, when you look at the long-term look at inter interactive or call it machine steering or a level beyond level three or four, 
we see that there is when steering really takes off. Steering at the level two area on a commercial truck, it's more of a driver convenience feature. Right. And remember, these are still level one and two systems. The driver is still the main main driver. And having a like a lane departure, we have a lane departure warning today, which doesn't have steering intervention, but adding lane keeping puts an actual, you can have a haptical interface back to the driver and actually correct the vehicle back in its lane. Can be beneficial, but then you have to look at the payback versus like spending it on a collision mitigation system or whatever. It's now you're starting to get a little bit more of icing on the cake until you go beyond level three. Okay. And uh, what other types of new capabilities will we see in the, the next generation of, uh, say, Wingman Fusion and, and uh, active safety systems on the market? Uh, what's next? You know, what are the next uh, big steps for, for you at Bendix, and, and what can uh, uh, fleets expect to see in, in the near term, say, in the next few years? Yeah, you, you're going to have much better sensing capability more around the vehicle when you start talking about functions like highway pilot where you're operating partially automated and let's say divided highway configurations now you have to have sensing all the way around the tractor trailer to be able to sense when can i do a lane change automatically those types of things and those are coming and that's going to come from improved sensing capability both camera and radar front camera and radar on the sides of the vehicle and then there has to be intelligence on the trailer along with communications and architecture to see what's going on behind the trailer and all that coming together and allowing that vehicle to operate in a highly automated driving type of operation. I think you're also starting to see some of the uh, improvements in processing power so that all the sensor technology is coming together. You're also able to put more information into a microprocessor, uh, get a better view on what's going on around you execute algorithms that are going to be more important so the automation can be executed properly. And the building blocks then become appropriate so that we can see an evolution towards redundancy, safety cases are written, and the building blocks that we're incorporating today will become what's necessary for full safety systems to be executed tomorrow. Okay. And then just uh, before we run out of time, I do want to take a step back and kind of look at the big picture of uh, driver assist technology, which of course is the, you know, the, the mainstream use of this technology. Um, you know, and, and of course, we'll continue to advance in the year, years ahead versus uh, the push for highly automated vehicles, which we see from certain tech startups. And uh, on some level, the, uh, some of the truck makers are, are working in that as well. Uh, but I want to get your perspective at Bendix. Uh, what are your thoughts on the path forward for this industry? Uh, do you see a, a path for, for both approaches, for, for ADAS and highly automated? Uh, or, one be the, will, or will one be the clear winner uh, as we look at that? I really think that um, ADOS is the predecessor to highly automated driving and as you see this, I call it an evolution because I expect you're going to find more and more interaction between the machine and the driver in a way that keeps that whole environment safe and that underneath is leading us all to understand better how a truck moves, truck motion control, the dynamics around what trucks do in different situations, all the data collected around that, whether it's safety direct concept, um, you know, some of the startups that you referred to are learning tremendous amounts about how trucks actually operate um, out in the wild, as it were, and from that they can start to build the artificial intelligence algorithms that can then in the long term be appropriate for uh, highly automated driving. But I think ADOS is here for a long time. And I think the things like corner cases that you can't necessarily anticipate until you actually have it, and it's a very rare event, are going to necessarily have to be captured and incorporated into um, the ADOS system so that then they can eventually become part of the highly automated driving system. Yeah, that last 1% of uh, the unusual things that can happen out on the road. Much further down, yeah. much point, further past point the decimal zero, point. Zero, zero, zero one. Yep. Yeah, that's the, you know, the, the one in a million yep. uh, situations that are so hard to program for if you if you can't even anticipate it. Uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to, to leave us with as we look to the future of this industry? It's a very interesting time. It's going to be a lot of fun over the next five to ten years. There's a lot of things changing in transportation. Yeah, well, I'd say it's, it's amazingly exciting. I, I think at this point uh, I, I'd be interested in coming back ten years from now and just looking and seeing what did we say it would happen and if we actually <laughs> were close at all in predicting it. Well, I certainly agree with you there, and um, you know, I'm certainly well published enough that I'll be on the hook for that, and I'll, I'll be uh, eager to put that in the time capsule as well and, and see how we all did. But I uh, really appreciate it, Mike and uh, Richard, for taking time out of a you know, bu very busy trade show here to, to share your thoughts, and definitely uh, very eager to see what you ha guys have up your sleeves uh, moving forward. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Right. Thank you very much. You
great isn't just in our name, it's in our DNA. Great is our foundation, our promise, it's our call to action. Great is our outstanding commitment to our customers and our customers' customers, whose hard work drives us, inspires us. Great demands more, goes further, it leads the way, answers the call. From the first mile to the last, for the road ahead, for over a century, we've worked tirelessly to live up to our name and we'll keep working because great doesn't stop. Great Dane Trailers. We're here in Atlanta at the 2019 North American Commercial Vehicle Show and we're very pleased to welcome John Morrison, president of Wabco Americas. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Seth. So I want to take some time to discuss take rates for active safety technologies like collision mitigation and lane departure warnings. Those systems have been on the market for years now, but overall industry adoption still is uh, somewhat limited. So I want to start with your take on where we stand now. What are take rates? What are overall sure. de deployment rates in, in the uh, Class 8 uh, trucking industry sure. today? Well, first of all, uh, when we talk about safety systems, again, I think one of the things that we're very excited about is the fact that take rates are increasing. And I think we see that... Uh, for many customers, uh, the payback uh, is there uh, when they see not only what they uh, are mitigating from the standpoint of accidents and injuries and you know the tragedies that happen on the road, but also from a business perspective, when they look at how they're managing risk and, and their overall risk profile, I think they're seeing you know quite good results uh, from the technology as it is today. And as you know, uh, things like collision mitigation, for example, started over 10 years ago. Um, I think that experience factor that we have is carrying on to other uh, technologies like lane departure warning, like uh, side object warning, uh, and even active steering where the receptivity for safety systems is also increasing, uh, but still there's this time period that we need in order to be able to experience the technology, see what it does, and factor it into a particular customer's fleet application or OEM's uh, strategy. Uh, when we look at take rates specifically, uh, occlusion mitigation systems now are probably in the 40 to 50 percent uh, minimally on Class 8 vehicles. And this is essentially on a voluntary basis. Um, they are standard at many OEMs, uh, but there's still a delete option, so you can delete it off of the spec if you want to. Uh, in many cases, uh, the dealers, uh, for example, uh, the dealerships won't specify on stock trucks, uh, or they may have arrangements with certain customers to be able to do that, and, and that does help the take rate. But right now, it's about half the trucks, uh, Class okay. A trucks right now, are being built with collision mitigation. So that's really powerful when you consider the number of trucks that we're building. Right. Uh, and also, we see collision mitigation now migrating into the medium duty sector. So this is also something that we're involved in, and uh, that's a function of both uh, just the time it's taken to release the technology, as well as there are certain things on the medium duty side that are unique. Uh, that have to be overcome in order to be able to get that technology deployed. So we really are approaching that 50% uh, mark where right. about half the trucks are, are being equipped with, uh, with this technology. Uh, and it does feel like an inflection point, uh, and we're getting closer to, the, to that tipping point. Uh, but we do see that, uh, of course, many of the large fleets have been using collision mitigation for many years, uh, but adoption rates are lower for more of the medium-sized market, getting down to small carriers. Uh, what do you think it'll take to boost adoption rates across that segment of the industry? I think it's a couple things. Uh, one, I think certainly the word of mouth and the experience from the larger fleets uh, where they see uh, the benefit. Uh, I think in many cases, larger fleets are self-insured. So I think that's a more direct uh, ROI for them to experience. I think for mediums and smalls, uh, we still have to see the insurance companies, I think, recognizing the benefit. Uh, in the case of collision mitigation, it's common to see uh, accident reduction rates of 70, 80, 90 percent. Uh, in fact, we had one fleet in our office a couple of weeks ago, and they were nearly 100 percent reduction in rear end collisions since they'd implemented the technology in 2016. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that kind of benefit, I think, has to translate into the insurance world um, in terms okay. of their actuarials and, uh, uh, and their statistics. But I do think I did hear a story where one insurance company was not raising rates anymore. So I do think <laughs> for the small and medium fleets where they're uh, they're paying their own insurance, I think uh, connecting that into the insurance industry and and enabling them to see a business benefit along with the safety benefits, I think, is important for further adoption. 
Sure. So when you, you think about the return on investment, you, you of course, you're, you're reducing crashes and you, and you see, of course, the cost of crashes has, has gone up and, and some of the uh, settlements and, and jury awards uh, we've seen lately uh, can definitely uh, scare some, some mid-sized businesses and, you know, one, one case might even sink your company. Uh, are you hearing more and more of that from, from some of your newer customers? I think that what I hear more is, uh, for example, we've launched collision mitigation, as you said. It's been in the market for a long time. I think people inherently, uh, the customers there inherently understand the benefit. But now we see more where we're coupling that with video capture, for example. And so that system's able to trigger certain critical event videos. And this is where I see that connection being quite powerful from the standpoint of helping to mitigate uh, not only risk, but also mitigate, uh, you know, the uh, business side of things that come along with accidents. And quite frankly, again, in, in all cases, the fleet just wants to know what happened. And I think uh, that's the important thing is to understand and the video capture along with the data that you get from the sensors really gives you that pretty accurate picture of what happened. And I think this is uh, a really powerful way to move that forward and help them uh, help the fleets be more confident if something uh, tragic does happen. At least they know what happened and they can reconstruct it uh, well and then they can manage that appropriately with the combination of the sensors and the video. Okay. And FMCSA recently announced a project aimed at promoting the adoption of ADAS, uh, Advanced Driver Assist Systems, uh, as a way to improve highway safety. And the agency will be partnering with industry groups like American Trucking Associations and TMC, you know, as, as part of that effort. But, you know, what are your thoughts, John, on what it will take for a, a project like that, you know, that, that's focused on uh, uh, promoting the technology and, and educating the industry about the technology? What will it take for that to, to really succeed? Yeah, I think uh, we're always in favor, and we do support the DOT uh, in many aspects from the standpoint of education, uh, providing awareness to them, and understanding of, of the technology. And I'm excited about the fact that um, FMCSA is being proactive in terms of putting a program like that out there. I think the industry needs to embrace it as well uh, from the standpoint of helping to connect uh, uh, both the government and the industry to the benefits of the technology, the payback. Um, early in the days when we were looking at uh, stability control and collision mitigation, there were several studies that were done by the DOT to, to look at the, the payback. And I just think anything that they can do to broadly create an awareness, uh, not only at a federal level, but a state and local level, then that helps, uh, you know, in terms of driving an understanding of the technology and the awareness. And as we said, it, when we get to penetration levels of 50, 60 percent, if you go back to stability control, for example, uh, we don't advocate a mandate, but what really pushed it to nearly 100% was that ultimately um, it became an NPRM and, and the DOT uh, NHTSA uh, made it required. And I think uh, when we look at the cost benefit and we look at uh, where that technology can go, um, I think uh, programs like this can help get that awareness uh, level up and, and get a broader understanding that will help us uh, move forward You know, to get those higher adoption rates. Sure. And... You know, it does seem that, the, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, the adoption will be based on uh, the business case rather than a mandate. Uh, that, and that stands in contrast to Europe where there is uh, more uh, regulation and, and uh, government mandate toward uh, active braking, uh, automatic braking as a uh, soon-to-be requirement. Uh, but uh, the approach in, in the U.S. government has been more to uh, promote and uh, support and let the business case uh, stand for itself. And, and we're totally comfortable with that. I think, again, the business case is quite strong. I think it's, again, it's, it's on us uh, to continue to promote and, and to, to educate. But, again, when we get, uh, for example, like FMCSA or DOT to also be promoting and supporting, then, again, I think that endorsement is, is quite important to get people yeah. to the business case because certainly the business case for safety systems is there. Sure. Now, for fleets that haven't spec safety systems in the past, uh, maybe the ones that uh, uh, do uh, uncheck that box as they're ordering trucks, uh, maybe they're operating on uh, thin margins, uh, maybe a smaller company uh, and that doesn't necessarily think they can invest in a, in a full system, uh, what would you say is a good place for them to, to start to move in that direction? Uh, would it be you know, air disc brakes? Would it be something else uh, that they can start specking uh, in greater numbers uh, to, to enhance safety if they aren't going to go all the way to a full collision sure. mitigation system? Sure. I, I think what's good is the state of the art of the technology today is one where you're pretty safe to start wherever you feel comfortable. In many cases, each fleet has their own challenges depending on how they, you know, where they're running and what they haul and, and all that kind of stuff. 
But in the end, uh, if you take disc brakes, for example, um, we've uh, really seen quite a maturity in terms of that technology. Um, we're at Wabco actually launching our fifth generation of single piston braking technology. So from a weight reduction and performance perspective, it's, it's quite a powerful proposition. But we also have to, um, and we're obligated to reduce the cost differential between drum and disc based on that payback, and that's what we've been working very hard to do because we realize it's a business, um, and it's not required, but it, it's really better braking, and it's, it's better stopping distance, it's better performance, the driver likes it better. So we have an obligation to make sure we try to narrow that cost differential because these guys run a tough business, uh, but it's still a pretty uh, safe bet to choose that technology because it's very robust and the service network is, is now filled with parts and, and the, the vehicles can be serviced anywhere uh, and things like that. So I think, uh, you know, whether you pick collision mitigation, whether you pick uh, disc brakes, I, I think uh, with where we are with technology today, it's fairly well proven. And uh, I think it comes down to, um, you know, what you're doing in your business and how it can benefit you. Okay. Another recent development we've seen with active safety is the early stages of steering control start to uh, work their way into uh, this industry. Uh, just tell us your thoughts on what, uh, how much of a difference this will make for the industry you know, once you start to look at uh, controlling uh, some level of automatic control for, for steering as well, not just uh, a braking acceleration. Sure. sure. This technology is so exciting, uh, Seth, because when I look at the driver and I look at their what they have to do to drive a truck day in, day out, uh, one of the most amazing things about the active steering technology is it really makes the driving experience a lot better for the driver. Uh, we have wind damping control, we have road crown compensation, we have what we call bump control, which is basically on a bumpy road, the steering wheel is not jostled. It, it, the, the technology and the electronics, by electronically controlling uh, that steering input, uh, gives the driver basically a seamless feel to driving. So when we look at driver fatigue and driver comfort, uh, you know, it's, it's really an amazing contribution uh, to overall uh, comfort and, and, and safety in terms of driving the truck. Then we can integrate that with the safety systems like the collision mitigation system, like the side object detection, like the, the lane departure radar, where in that instance a driver might be just distracted for a few minutes or a second even um, and starts to drift out of the lane without the turn signal on. It's going to gently pull you back in. It's not a hard jerk. It's going to guide that vehicle back into the lane. And the technology is as, as such today, we always want that driver engaged. So we, it's not like an, it's fully automated steering, right. but it's going to be there as a backup and certainly uh, enables a much more uh, seamless feel to steering uh, and keeping the, the vehicle within the lanes uh, going down the road, even if for some reason you might be slightly distracted. It will also pick up if the driver hasn't really put much input. And therefore, if, if we did have some type of drowsy driving or distracted driving, um, the system itself is going to come back and, and ask the driver to get re-engaged. So those things, I think, are really uh, powerful for a driver uh, as well as for a fleet. Sure. Uh, now I'd like to just open it up a little bit to talk about uh, other new developments at Wabco. Uh, what are some other new products and features that you'll be uh, introducing sure. uh, to the market soon? Well, we're very proud to introduce uh, our new excuse me, intelligent trailer program. Uh, we call it IABS, and uh, it replaces our existing uh, trailer ABS platform, which has been out there for over 15 years. Uh, what we've done there is we've really added a lot more opportunity to draw data uh, and vital vehicle information off of a trailer. And we see the trailer becoming uh, a much more important part of the overall combination as we look at safety systems, we look at brake balancing, we look at how we control an overall vehicle combination. And we can do this independent of the power unit. So basically the trailer uh, IABS um, can not only provide the ABS braking, but can also provide a lot of data information via a CAN network now uh, back through the truck in order to be able to transmit that to operations. Whereas before we might have had to transmit that wirelessly or download from a PLC. Now we can do it, do it really real time uh, through the CAN network, which is really a breakthrough in terms of really now connecting the trailer fully into the truck operation enabling a fleet to be able to see the entire truck trailer combination yeah. and, and get that vital information that comes off of it. So we anticipate that there'll be uh, some really interesting uh, data and information products will be generated from that. In addition to the fact that it's just, it's a better system. Uh, you know, it's taking mm -hmm. advantage of a lot of technology and a lot of robustness that we've learned over time in terms of connectors and durability and uh, just ensuring that you know, that brain that's on the back of a trailer is safe and sound mm -hmm. and, and is going to be there no matter where that trailer is. 
Understood. Now, uh, another uh, development that's uh, been big news in the industry was uh, uh, ZF Group's uh, agreement to acquire Wabco. Uh, it was announced earlier this year. Uh, the deal hasn't closed yet, but uh, we're all watching it uh, closely. And uh, I know there's only so much you can say about it, but I am uh, eager to hear your, your thoughts on the, the possibilities of that merger uh, sure. between Wabco and, and ZF. Sure. Well, first of all, we're really excited. Uh, we announced the merger on March 28th, um, and uh, since that point in time, we've been going through the process, as you might imagine, of getting the two companies merged. Uh, our shareholders at Wabco approved the merger at the end of June. And right now we're in the process. There's fairly, uh, various regulatory uh, and uh, procedural things that have to happen that we have to take care of globally, and that's what we're doing right now. So the team's working on that. Uh, but we're also working on uh, a level of integration planning so that when we hit day one, uh, people know what to do, know how to do it. Uh, we're not working together. We're not allowed to do that. But we can plan things and, and right. talk about how things uh, can be uh, when we get started. And uh, that's really exciting because when you see that coming together and you see what both Wabco and ZF and the commercial vehicle space can bring, um, it's going to be uh, a very large player in the commercial vehicle space, but more importantly is uh, the technology integration and the entire platform from chassis to braking to uh, powertrain uh, really makes it quite powerful. And we're really excited to be a part of that and excited to be a part of ZF. Yeah, well, we'll be watching closely and uh, we'll see how it all plays out. Um, since we're here at the uh, second edition of NACV, uh, I do want to get your thoughts on the show. Um, you know, just what's, what are your takeaways just from your, the limited time you've had to walk around? I'm sure you've been busy in, in all kinds of meetings, but from what you've seen of the show floor and, and the show itself, uh, what are your thoughts? It's really a great place to come and look at technology. Uh, certainly, uh, I think that was always the focus was to bring technology to this show. And, and I think that both the OEMs and the supply base have done that. When you walk around, you can see a lot of new introductions, a lot of new technology. Um, the, the press conferences, I think, are, are rich in that kind of content. So if you want to come to one place to see it all, uh, this, is, this is certainly a place that you can do that. And I think that uh, uh, everyone here has, has really taken full advantage of that. So uh, I think it's still uh, a young show. Uh, so it's a show that has to continue to grow and, and really solidify its identity in the whole uh, show process, uh, but I certainly think when you look at the players here, the content, uh, and also the technology uh, that is brought uh, into bear when we come here, I think this has a bright future. Okay, and then uh, before I let you go, I do want to have uh, you know, ask you a final question about you know, this, this broader pathway toward you know, driver assist and automated driving. You know, of course, has been a, a, a major topic for the industry over the last several years. Uh, you know, of course, we were looking mostly at uh, driver assistance uh, in, in the near term, but of course, there are other players, you know, startups. There are, uh, and, and to some extent, the OEMs that are also uh, looking at highly automated vehicles and the right applications and, and the R and D that goes into that. Uh, so, John, I just want to ask your thoughts. Uh, you know, how do you view that at Wabco? Uh, are you pursuing both paths, or you know, do you see one as clearly the, the the way to go and uh, over over the other? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting time because you you can't at this stage really pick which path you go. You have to really stay open to technology. You have to stay open to the vision of what uh, full automation might bring. Uh, what we're working on is building automated capabilities. So each block of uh, technology that we add, whether it's in collision mitigation, in ADOS, in uh, steering, uh, we, we want to add those pieces that really progress uh, the vehicle to enable a more automated function, again, for safety and, and business benefits as well. When we talk about full automation, um, there's some really interesting uh, things that are happening there, obviously, with uh, certain companies like Waymo and Too Simple and Embark. And, and, uh, and as we look at braking, what Wavco does, um, also there's some interesting things as the brake system itself has to prepare for that platform. And there's certain uh, things like redundancies and uh, failed operational braking, and, and um, you know that's what we do well. And uh, there's also, uh, when you look at how a vehicle is braked by a driver, that natural feel is something that's not easy to replicate in an automated world. And I think these are the things that enable us to really partner with the uh, AI companies uh, in terms of how do we get those external inputs that are quite complicated and quite complex and translate them into more of a natural driving and braking operation. I think this is where we come in and, and we've had uh, some developments relative to software interface between the AI and the uh, brake system 
custom layer that help do that and help manage that. And I think this is where WAPCO really plays well. And again, we've launched and will be launching some new brake system enhancements that not only more commonized EBS systems with ABS systems, because you're going to need more individual brake control uh, as we go right. forward for electrification and automation, yep. Uh, but also, again, some of the redundancies, some of the things that we have to have on a vehicle to ensure that there's a backup system in case the primary system doesn't uh, perform uh, in, in some event. Uh, those are also things that the brake system itself has to move forward and really be prepared to do. And I can tell you that the uh, uh, we're, we're working very hard on that right now. We've got some very exciting developments. Yeah, right in the middle of, uh, of all of it. Uh, very interesting uh, yeah. place to be. Yeah. And uh, thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to chat with us here at uh, NACV and at the TT booth. Um, you know, we really appreciate your insights, and thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Seth. Really appreciate yep. it. Ten everyday uses of transport topics on Alexa. One, while you get ready for work in the morning. Two, while you cook breakfast. Three, while you eat breakfast. Four, while you drive to work. Five, while you're at work. Six, while you eat your lunch. Seven, while you're driving home. Eight, while you cook dinner. Nine, while you eat dinner. 10, while, well, let's face it, it's one minute with today's biggest industry headlines. The listening options are endless, so why be confined to 10? Simply say, okay, Google, talk to Transport Topics. Before we close, let's take a moment to reconsider our original question. What will it take to boost adoption of active safety technology? And how will these systems improve in the future? As we've heard from our guests, a growing percentage of fleets are specking active safety systems on their vehicles. In fact, it may not be long until collision mitigation technology becomes near universal on new Class 8 trucks. Large fleets that have adopted the technology are seeing a return on investment based on significant reductions in forward collision rates. And over time, adoption will grow as smaller fleets and medium-duty operators also see the benefits of these safety technologies, which could be a way to help address rising insurance costs. These systems will also continue to improve over time. Looking ahead, active steering capabilities will represent the next big step for safety technology. But the same question will apply. How quickly will fleets invest in lane-keeping assist and similar automated steering features as they reach the market? That's a question that only time will answer. If you've enjoyed this episode of Road Signs, please let others know. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If my questions have sparked questions of your own, share them with me and the Road Signs team. You can email us at share at ttnews.com. We'll read them and respond daily. And of course, we'll continue the conversation about trucking technology in future episodes of Road Signs. Until then, I'm Seth Clevenger. Thank you for listening.